So I want to start by saying thank you very much for taking the time out today to, um, to join us in this Design Bytes event. My name is Sharon Young. I'm from Design Capital. I'm joined by my colleague Amanda Carson um, from the Design Capital team. And we're delighted to welcome uh, Suzanne Woodside, Client Director at Mint. And Suzanne's going to chat to us today about um, how to look at the foundation of your e-commerce uh, website design, um, looking at user experience and customer experience. Um, and she's also going to look at ways to drive traffic to your website. Um, I am going to hand over to Suzanne. Um, she's going to briefly introduce herself or um, say hello and then share her screen for a presentation. At the end, we will have a look at or we will be taking some questions um, and would really encourage you to pop those questions in the chat as we go through um, and then Amanda and myself will um, pick up on those at the end. So please do um, add your questions to the chat as we go through. Um, so I'm now going to hand over to Suzanne. Thank you, Sharon. Um, afternoon, everyone. So um, although this is the, the second of two webinars, uh, the first one I think was back in June, they, they are both standalone in terms of their content and, and the topics around e-commerce. But I'll provide both decks, webinar one and two, uh, with the speaker notes so um, you can go through them. Um, and reference back to the content in your own time. So as a quick introduction, since Mint started in, in 2000, there have been you know, huge changes in technology in connectivity and purchasing behaviours um, and customer expectations. And then the, the pandemic created you know, an even bigger shift with customers now sourcing goods and services that, that weren't typically bought online. Um, and this has cracked open uh, an even bigger marketplace for e-commerce. So with that shift comes changing expectations um, and more strategies and tactics that brands use to win online business. And we're going to delve into some of those in today's uh, webinar. So e-commerce is, is a very broad topic. Um, and I've tried to include insight that's relevant to uh, different business models and also uh, different stages of your e-commerce journey. I think you can drop in questions as we go through uh, and then um, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions at the end of the presentation. So I think I can just share my screen. Hopefully you can all see that okay. So a very quick recap on uh, webinar one. So webinar one focused on planning to assist administration and content, brand and marketing, um, planning for UX and planning for customer experience. Um, the planning phase is typically the most under-resourced phase in terms of the time given to it and, and also the budget but it's probably one of the most important in terms of maximizing that budget and then getting the e-commerce fundamentals uh, correct. So if you want that webinar one, um, we can certainly provide that to you. Today's webinar, webinar two, we will cover um, UX, the design essentials, tactics such as personalization and social proofing. We're gonna have a look at an e-commerce sales funnel and then also um, ideas around a content marketing strategy. So user experience design, known as the acronym UX. Often when people consider design, they will think in terms of having an aesthetically pleasing website. And that's important because it provides visitors with that positive first impression. However, Although UX design certainly includes aesthetics, it, it goes further than that to ensure your website's intuitive um, and that the structure and layout works to convert a visitor into a customer. So it is possible to have a website that initially looks great, but visually it can deliver a poor user experience. So we're gonna look at some pointers on how to consider and bring all of the necessary um, elements together into a great overall user experience. So this is Nike.com's 
uh, homepage, um, their e-commerce retail site. And Nike has to be one of the best out there. It's what you expect from a big brand, although big brands can get it wrong. Uh, and part of its beauty is in its simplicity. So aesthetically, it looks great. The imagery is high quality. It's unfussy. Um, and the navigational options are, are clear throughout the site. When you're going through it, you always feel in control of the search and, and they have a, a checkout, which really just feels seamless. So the whole site has a really effortless experience. Now, I recognize if, if you're building an e-commerce site, you're, you'll rely on your web developer to implement a, you know, your successful UX. But you want to be in a position to drive this um, and provide your project team with the business insight for them to interpret. So if your brief includes your planning, research, um, and the customer insight that we included in webinar one, and then your UX expectations, then you're going to be in a better position to pick the right developer and work in a, a successful partnership with them. So on the flip side, this is Homebase and they came top of the worst website survey conducted by Witch Magazine, uh, three years running. So some issues are operational, such as um, slow or non-deliveries, uh, damaged parcels. Others are poor customer service, um, no receipt of order updates, and also people complained of getting through the checkout only then to be told that the um, item's not in stock. And as you can also see, the photography's cluttered and its content almost makes it look like a, like a furniture company. So this is really an example of, of a big brand getting it wrong. So what is user experience? Um, Interaction Design Foundation define it as UX design will create a website that provides a, uh, a meaningful and relevant experience to your visitors. This involves the design of the entire website, including aspects of branding, design, usability, and function. So it's important to consider that a great user experience is important for both the user and the business, because ultimately the end goal is to guide users to what they want um, and then convert them from visitors to customers. And what is aesthetics? Aesthetics is a core design principle that defines the design's pleasing qualities. Designers use aesthetics to complement their design's usability and so enhance functionality with attractive layouts. So UX design in, from a functional perspective, this is not finite, but you would look at load speed, uh, intuitive navigation, a fast checkout process, clear pre and post sale customer service. You want a system in place to bring people back and you want to show credibility and customer satisfaction. With load speed, uh, make sure you optimize and test how long it takes for the homepage to load into the browser. Make sure this is tested before you launch the site. So on average, if your website takes longer than three seconds to load, approximately 40% of your visitors are going to abandon the site. Um, and if load speed is an issue, then loading videos and, and unoptimized images are usually the culprits. Uh, intuitive navigation. So a website's navigation isn't restricted to the main navigation bar on the homepage. You also need to consider how your website traffic can navigate from within the inner sections and across different products. So you, you basically want them to carry out a series of functions um, and tasks. And that means moving between different areas. And this is where you need to consider the full remit of your user journey before the site build begins. A fast checkout process. So consumers expect an online experience that's simple, convenient, and fast. Focus on achieving that, especially at the checkout, by ensuring that you have a quick and easy process in place. And also, I, I would recommend having uh, a guest checkout option that's equally as prominent as the usual um, account setup option. So don't force people as much as you're tempted to, to provide anything more than the, the minimal information 
uh, that's required for them to complete the transaction. For pre and post sales customer service, customer service can be your USP. And if you look at the ranking explanations for the best and worst websites, you'll find that customer service features at the top of both lists. So be upfront and transparent with your, uh, your customer service operating hours. Uh, make sure your contact information is clear, whether that's phone, email, uh, and or a chatbot. Also be clear about the response time that your audience can expect. A system in place to bring users back. Um, this can include establishing digital marketing retargeting, uh, segmenting your uh, visitors' email addresses for future email marketing, and also links and incentives to join your social media platforms. Credibility and customer satisfaction. So this, this is a tactic called social proofing. And it can be something as simple as including uh, testimonials and reviews. It's very effective at increasing conversion rates. And I'm gonna cover that in a bit more detail later on in the, the presentation. So if we look at uh, personalization, um, personalization, so this means giving customers a personalized online experience uh, based on previous actions, browsing behavior, uh, purchase history, demographics, and, and other uh, personal information. So examples of personalization, uh, communications based on user behavior. So you've probably at some stage received an email um, to say that you've put something in uh, a basket, but you haven't completed the transaction. Also personalized offers, personalized recommendations, recommendations based on similar user behavior um, and personalization based on real time data such as uh, location or time. So this is achieved by using the key data points uh, and the analytics that most of the main e-commerce platforms would, would incorporate as standards such as WooCommerce and, and Shopify, or you can get these through API integrations. So other data points include visitor age, uh, gender, weather, location, uh, as well as current and past searches. So this is something you'll be able to tap into with your developer uh, and use it for both personalization on your website and also in your digital marketing. So an example here is on Halford's homepage, which I have logged into. So you can see it says, hi Suzanne, so it's personalized, recognizes me when I log back in. It's uh, showing local weather forecasts and it's also telling me where my nearest store is, as well as recommended purchases. So that's an example there of, of personalization. Another example is this modal window. So that recognizes that the visitor hasn't yet purchased from the site and, and therefore it's offering them um, a 5% discount. This is a screen from a J Cruise website. So the, the visitor gets to a point where they're looking at a product and J Crew's tactic here helps with cross-selling. So they're recommending other items that go with that product. Um, and ideally they're trying to persuade the visitor uh, to buy even more. So this shows product recommendations based on what people with similar interests the visitor have viewed. Um, and that's done by measuring data points in the background and you're picking out products viewed by people with a similar profile, such as age, gender, and location. All of these personalization tactics would be developed into the website at the time of the bill. So that's something to be aware of um, and to include in your brief and to have a discussion with your developer. I've used retail examples here, but it can also be used on uh, B2B sites as well. Social proofing. 
This is another uh, tactic that e-commerce marketers have increasingly honed in on for competitive advantage. Social proof is a demonstration that other people have made a choice um, partaken in your product or service, thereby encouraging others to do so. The theory behind this is that people will trust the opinions and actions of your customers more than they'll trust you. So examples of social proofing are um, testimonials and business credentials, showing best sellers, product likes, that can also be integrated with uh, social media, urgency and scarcity, and uh, customer reviews. So on this homepage, if you uh, look in the bottom left against that sort of pinky red background, it says this item is trending right now. Um, and that's a sense of urgency that you're uh, applying onto the visitor. Also a top right, 678 people have viewed this in the last 24 hours. Again, that's a sense of urgency. And then scarcity is what you can see there on the blue background. And that's saying only eight items are left in, in stock now, uh, uh, right now. And then also it could be something such as you know, CLNs at midnight, those type of, of messages. Best sellers is another form of social proofing because it's giving kudos to selected products and it evokes a, almost like a sense, a, a fear of missing out in, in customers. In B2B, uh, case studies are a really good way. Uh, they're, they're a great form of social proof. Um, and they're also an opportunity to educate and sell the visitor uh, on the benefits of your product or service. Um, testimonials are also good to use in B2B sites alongside client logos, which are, you know, which we recognize within your industry. Then finally, uh, reviews using a site such as Trustpilot. So the fact that it's an independent platform does give it more weight. Um, and because it has authority with Google, then it's also really good for your website's SEO. People can be reluctant to use independent review channels, um, probably due mainly to the lack of control over them. But if it's a standard with your competitors, then it, then it really is something that you should consider. An e-commerce sales funnel. So er everything that we've looked at so far is within your website. Whereas the e-commerce funnel starts to look at the system you have around your website. Um, and really it's a, it's a visual guide for the different stages of your, your customer journey. So first you have to consider that you have to drive traffic to your website. Secondly, you have to consider that over 90% of the traffic that arrives on your site will not make a purchase on the first visit. And thirdly, not only do you have to bring those people back to your website, but they will be at different stages of their customer journey. So the same content is not going to work for your entire audience. And that's where the e-commerce funnel is. It's a good reference to show you how you can segment your audience and then work towards converting leads into customers. Now, there are different variations of the sales funnel, and uh, they do tend to be um, all quite similar. You have the top of the funnel, um, so the, very, the starting point is up at awareness, that's where your traffic arrives. And then the idea is that you nudge them down through the funnel until you get them to buy. So in terms of your website, it, it, it's not going to be build it and they will come, um, but more how you at the top level make people aware of your business then how you engage them, and then how you convert those leads into sales. So at the top part of the funnel, you, you have awareness and digital advertising be, can be quite popular, social media, using promotional videos, infographics, and, and blog articles. Awareness is about getting noticed um, and being bold and clear in your messaging. So who you are, what you do, 
why you do it and, and how. Um, it tends to be more of an entertainment stage, so it's not so much of, of a hard sell. And then you want to nudge them down towards the interest phase so that they're aware of your brand, they're aware of, of your company. Articles, live demos and intros, live webinars, lead magnets, um, and good offers tend to be uh, what, what's used at the interest stage. So here you want to educate them and, then, and demonstrate what's unique about your business. So depending on your business model and what you're selling, you can also start to capture the contact, contact information such as email addresses. So an example is if you're a software company or, or say a sports equipment company, you could have say a live demo of a piece of equipment or of your software platform and it is reasonable to ask for an email address for them to, to access those and, and also to um, avail of your lead magnets. Then we move down into the middle of the funnel. Um, and at the consider stage, this is probably where the harder sell begins. Again, it depends on what's suitable and viable for your business model, but this could be email offers, one-to-one -one communication, uh, free trials, and, and also what we call a tripwire, which is an exceptional sort of unmissable uh, incentive of, of some sort. And that's where you're really trying to encourage them towards making a, a purchase. Then you get to the buy stage. And once they're here, this is when you need your website checkout process uh, and your customer service and support to be really on point. The quicker that they can make that transaction, the, the less of a chance you have of uh, buyer's remorse and, and losing them at, at this stage. And then just when you think the funnel's done, so once somebody has become a customer, you, you want to retain them. Um, and ideally, you also want to use them to expand your audience. So methods for retention include ongoing engagement, which that could be through email marketing. It could be uh, by creating communities on social media, incentives um, and loyalty schemes, your VIP offers, upgrades, pre-sale access and, and that kind of thing. And to expand, um, you can um, affiliate sometimes in software that can be um, uh, affiliates and incentivized discounts. Another newer method is almost to make your customers an unofficial brand ambassadors. So that's obviously a line that their experience so far has been um, entirely positive. You want to get them sharing content and uh, you encouraging customers to cultivate and participate on, on social media and online platforms. And then you'll see that the arrow goes back up to the top of the funnel because this is really a continual effort then with the new traffic that you're, you're, you're driving towards your site. So your content strategy. So what is a content strategy? It focuses on the planning, creation, delivery, and governance of content. Content not only includes the words on the page, but also the images and the multimedia that are used. So you can see how the, the sales funnel identifies the different stages of the customer journey and your, your content strategy needs to be aligned with this. So you're sending out what your audience wants to receive at, at a particular time. So I've shown an example here of the type of content platforms, uh, webinars, easings, short form content, Interviews, ebooks, guest blogs, and video are all um, really popular formats. Video is a particularly strong one for e commerce. And then you can use different channels such as social media, digital advertising, email marketing, and online communities. Um, always with that content, the, the end goal is to drive that traffic uh, back to your website. And then we look here, this is a content and customer alignment journey. So this works really well alongside the e-commerce sales funnel, and it's going to enable you to be 
exceptionally customer focused. So what I've shown here is it's very customer centric. So need recognition, what, what uh, can help me, step-by-step -step guides, which brand do I trust, how do I do better? Those are the questions that uh, your audience will be asking as they go along this process. Then they're looking at research options, what catches my eye, what do I need, which brand do I recall, what is trendy and trending. And then we'll come to the point of evaluating brands. So how can I learn more? Can I try it first? They'll do detailed comparisons and they'll make a, a decision on who they believe is more helpful. And then once they get to that critical purchase phase, it will be cost benefits, uh, examples of social proof. Uh, they'll look at your warranties and returns and also on the qualities um, and offers. And then post-purchase, when ideally you want to get that retention, they'll think about what their experience was like, what was the after-sales service uh, and support. They'll look to a sense of community and um, uh, access to customer benefits. So that might be specific pre-sale access and, and benefits like that. If you can, when you, you're creating your content, align it with this then you're almost answering those questions as, as they go um, along their journey. So I'm aware that there will be people at very different stages of the e-commerce journey. Um, some of you might be considering starting an e-commerce business, whereas others may have been up and running for uh, you know, a, a period of time. So crawl, walk, run is a method to systematically level up your e-commerce. So even for, for us as a studio, we never stop learning um, and we have to consciously keep on top of new marketing trends, uh, new technology. So it's completely natural to be overwhelmed with all the different parts that you have to consider with an e-commerce business. And that's true whether you know, you're starting out or, or moving to the next phase. So following the principle of crawl, walk, run can help. So uh, essentially uh, get your baseline right at the crawl stage. Make sure your website is easy to navigate, that it's capable of fulfilling orders, that it's secure and equipped with the basic tools for, for building an audience. And going back to webinar one um, and what we covered in the planning, that's really where you sort of put in the foundations to achieve that. Then once you get to walk, so with more experience, you can start implementing more complex tactics that provide new ways to engage with your audience, new ways to grow your marketing strategy, or new ways to develop unique experiences on your website. And then run, you have a thorough understanding of your audience, the ultimate goals of your e-commerce website, and how you can expand outward. Your strategy will be sophisticated and then is large enough that it may depend on complex fulfillment and marketing methods. So that is the end of the webinar presentation. And yeah, happy to take any questions or go back and revisit any of those slides. Thanks very much, Suzanne. That was, that was really good. Um, I love that crawl, walk, run thing, because I think that sort of leaves it on a, at a stage where everyone can feel quite reassured that no matter where they are, there can be improvements as they kind of go along the line. So um, let me just see um, if there's, we haven't got any questions in the chat yet, but if anyone would like to pop something in, we'd be more than happy to get Suzanne to kind of maybe expand on, on some of the topics that she covered today. Just while we wait on those um, questions coming in, Suzanne, would you say there is like a typical or a, a good time frame for the crawl, walk, run um, strategy? I mean, do you think that crawl, it's, is it like, you know, for three to six months you crawl and then for the next three to six months you walk or or is it? Is it like a lot of these things where it's, you know, there's no one size fits all, but would you say there's like a, an average of how that might, how that might work? It's, I mean, it, I suppose it's, it's two pronged in, in one sense, uh, as somebody running an e-commerce 
business, ideally you're going to grow it using the data that you're getting in. Um, so a part of that is how much resource you can put in at, you know, at, at what pace you can really push that. Um, we have some clients who have started up and really pushed aggressively forward. Uh, they've tried to be, you know, clever tactics using their social media, which is a resource in itself because it takes time. But yes, I think within once you're getting in good quality data, say six months to a year, you know, between that period, then you you, you want to push on and and stretch out your your marketing tactics. A lot of it is trial and error as well. You know, it's not always hitting the right note the first time. Um, but we, we yeah, we, we've seen some clients who really expanded very, very quickly. Um, maybe I've had an e-commerce business that was alongside a bricks and mortar business, but actually the emphasis now really is, is on e-commerce. Okay. Um, I just see here's a question has come in from Kira in the chat. Um, Suzanne, um, and you mentioned ambassadors. Um, and Kira's wondering how can you um, how can you best create an ambassador for your online business and and how can you make it um, work in terms of discounts and social media uh, exposure? Uh, in terms of sourcing discounts, so we have a, a client actually at the minute in, in the software space, and um, they are picking somebody who is quite well known at blogging and on Instagram in the space, which is therapy of, of their product. And they've picked them to come on board to be their ambassador. So it doesn't necessarily have to, you know, someone who's really high profile is going to be probably quite expensive. So it just has to be picking somebody who uh, could maybe grow alongside the brand as well. Um, you know, so someone, someone who really gets your brand as well and, and really buys into your brand and sort of the way that you see it as well, I suppose. Yeah, the brand on the industry, you know, if it's somebody yeah. in fitness, mm -hmm. um, someone who, stating the obvious here, but somebody who is, you know, a major participant in that. So, you know, we can't all go for celebrity endorsements, but I think we can pick cleverly and have somebody who is, maybe it's more the face of your brand uh, rather than a well-known ambassador at times. And the second part of the question was on social media. Did you? Did yeah, you just ask? like how, how, how can you make it work through social media exposure? I think people love good quality content and it is about, I, I, I think it's about in a way giving valuable content away without the hard sell beside it. Again, maybe using fitness as an example. Um, or we're, we, we've worked recently on a, a, a project management software. So it is pushing out, say, tips on fitness or tips on project management, checklists and ebooks. Um, people love to, to get that sort of high quality info and to be educated. And then hopefully you, you get them in your brand world. And then eventually you start cultivating them towards becoming a, becoming a customer. So I think good quality content's the key. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Suzanne. We have another question. We have Kira, Kira McKee this time. Um, if you have a basic WordPress site, is it easy to convert to a website to sell from? Um, for example, can Shopify be added to that? Uh, if it's WordPress, you'd, you'd likely to go with WooCommerce. Um, rather, Shopify would be um, probably re rebuilding the site. Both are really good. We use both, um, WooCommerce, Shopify. Are, are the two e-commerce platforms we would mainly use. There are others, um, Squarespace tends to be more, as I understand it, for people building their own sites. Um, but you know, um, if it's WordPress, then I would look at WooCommerce. Uh, the questions are coming thick and fast now, Suzanne. <laughs> um, here's, here's one from um, Kate McCormick. Um, about uh, currencies and Kate's interest in knowing how important it is to sell in different in multiple currencies, either at the crawl stage or is it at the walk stage? And and at what stage does it become necessary that you have to actually have local sites? Oh, um, no, local sites. So we would tend to try to work off one single site. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, currencies. So you can have that, uh, if you like, programmed into your site where you know your your currencies are updated, and you can show 
you know, sterling, euros, and, and that, that can be done. And I guess it's whether um, you think that's going to have a major impact on your customer from the outset. I mean, I think keeping it as simple as possible when you start, depending on the size of the team that you have around you, but I would always recommend trying to start um, as simply as possible, but currencies shouldn't be um, anything major to actually integrate into your website as such. All the um, conversions would be managed for you in terms of you know exchange rates and that kind of thing. Okay, that's great, thanks. Next question um, is from Thomas Gilpin. Um, you mentioned, uh, actually this one was put, um, Thomas just put this one to hosts and panelists. So maybe not everybody, I'll, I'll actually just copy and paste that one into the, so everyone can see it. Um, you mentioned UX personalization being applicable for B2B as well. What are the best methods to use? Um, well, oh gosh, uh, there's there's much. So, what we've done, email. Let's start with email marketing, which um, a very simple tactic on that is is just to personalize the campaigns that you've sent out. If you have, say, a client area on your website that they go onto, if it's say if it's a, a I don't know, software product or, or some sort of admin that they go into. It's just simply making sure that all those are personalized as, as much as possible. There's no doubt personalization lends itself probably B to C. And, and as you saw, most of my examples were in retail, but they're, those are the subtle ways that you can do it for your, your B2B audience. Um, if you do, you know, if you're as a B2B targeting different sectors, um, depending on what your product or service is, part of it is not sending out a standard content to everyone. You know, it is about if uh, if somebody, a particular product isn't relevant to them, don't send it out to them, segment your audiences that way, which is, is a form of personalization for B2B. Um, thanks, Suzanne. Just on, on we're on uh, still on B two B. Um, was a message from Kirsten about um, if you are selling a service that maybe has a slightly uh, more convoluted buying process. Um, how can you? Uh, what tools can you employ to engage potential customers on your website so that they don't drop away before you actually convert to a purchase? Yeah, we, we've encountered this quite a bit. So um, it was actually a business that the, the, the product, it was a rental product and um, that, that was going down the e-commerce route. So uh, the, the price really changed on so due to so many different factors, the distance it was traveling, how long it was there for, what it was used for, et cetera. You can bring people into an e-commerce environment, but they don't necessarily have to complete the transaction at that moment, if that makes sense. So that's where you want, they go in, make their inquiries. You can either have like a quote mechanism within that so that they're setting up their order specification, you're getting back to them, but it's done in a really structured way on your, on your website. The advantage of that is that, um, well, from, from a business perspective with this rental company, the, the, their customers were paying up front, whereas before in their bricks and mortar version, it would have been you know, 30 day terms, that, that kind of idea. So there's a big uh, business advantage uh, to that as well. So it is like e-commerce, but they're not necessarily doing a checkout process straight away. Okay, that's great. Well, that looks like, um... Maybe that's all the questions um, covered for now. Suzanne, so um, thank you very much. There was just such a lot of valuable information in there. Um, I know it's a massive topic and I think you've managed to touch on lots of really um, pertinent parts of the um, of the whole process. So um, I think it was in the chat as well that we um, anyone can tap into uh, the, the either the first presentation or this one you just did today and they can um, browse that at their leisure um yeah. from uh, in the next few days or whatever so thank you very much for your time no and thank you very much everyone for attending 
uh, this afternoon. Thanks very much, Suzanne. Thanks. Thank everybody. you. Thank you.